In this video cast, we're going to be talking about biotechnology. Biotechnology is a way that humans apply our knowledge of genetics and the cell in order to do stuff with it. And it's a field that has a lot of job opportunities and research. So if you've been at all interested in, in what we've been doing the last unit or two, it's a good area for you to contemplate going into in the future. Our first topic is genetic engineering. And genetic engineering is essentially changing the genes of an organism on purpose. Humans have been doing this for a very, very long time. Um, we've been doing this in the form of selective breeding. Selective breeding is essentially trying to, res trying to get an offspring to have a particular set of characteristics by choosing who that offspring's parents are. And if we can choose the parents, then hopefully the, the offspring will inherit some of those parental traits and, and have a desired outcome. We've been doing this for thousands of years, and it started with plants. About 9,000 years ago, plants became the first species to be domesticated, and it was largely a result due to selective breeding. So they started with uh, maize, which is corn, wheat, and rice, crops that we still have today, of course, and they chose which plants were going to produce seeds by cross-fertilizing. In other words, taking pollen from one plant and, and rubbing it on the other plant. And in doing so, they selected plants that had desirable traits, such as germinating more often, being bigger, tastier, surviving different climates, etc., and resulted in plants that, um, though inherited characteristics from their parents, were significantly different than the wild versions of the plants that, are, that were existed at the time. Most domesticated species have been selectively bred. If you look at dogs, the original dog was a wolf, and modern-day dogs don't look much like that because of selective breeding choices to select for things like um, being hypoallergenic in modern, uh, modern times or being a good working dog in, in ancient time, or olden days. Most livestock have been selectively bred to grow um, meatier, to grow faster, to um, make milk more often. Most of our pets, like cats and bunnies and, and, and other animals, have also been selectively bred for desirable traits. We can see how selective breeding has occurred uh, through two examples of, of dog breeds. So hybridization is the crossing of parents with particular traits to hope that the offspring will have both of the traits. And we can see that with the um, Labradoodle. So the Labradoodle is a fairly new dog breed, and it came about because people really liked the characteristics of labs. They make really good family pets, and they have other traits that people enjoy. And people like poodles, in particular because poodles don't typically cause problems with people with allergies. And so in the last um, couple of decades, people have been breeding labs with poodles to get labradoodles and creating a whole new dog breed. And the labradoodles displaying favorable traits about the lab as well as the poodle. We do this with a lot of um, plant species as well. The problem is that it doesn't always have the outcome that we'd like, and it can be very time-consuming and expensive when you consider you have to wait for multiple generations to occur. Another type of uh, selective breeding is inbreeding, and we see this with the pug. So inbreeding is when two very closely related organisms who have the desired traits are mated to help hopefully get um, only the desired traits and get rid of the undesired traits. And that's where pure, the idea of purebreds come along. The pug is an example of this because it demonstrates a lot of the disadvantages. So people really like the pug face and they think it's cute and has traits that, that people find very favorable, like its size and its attach, attachment to people. But the pug also has a number of, of um, medical conditions because of the inbreeding. Some pugs have such a squished face that their, their nasal cavity and their... Um, the respiratory system is so scrunched that they have trouble breathing and they're always, have, always struggling to breathe. Uh, we see that with other species too, like labs that have a lot of hip dysplasia because of inbreeding. Let's take a minute and review. Of course, selective breeding doesn't really use our knowledge of DNA. It uses our knowledge of inherited traits. Biotechnology really talks about our knowledge of um, understanding how DNA works and DNA gets turned into protein. One of the coolest things we can do with biotechnology is using a technique called recombinant DNA. So recombinant DNA allows us to add DNA from one organism into another organism. Um, so insulin is a great example of this because we've been able to take the human insulin gene, or in other words, the recipe for making humans' version of insulin, and insert it into bacteria, which we can grow very, very quickly, and therefore allow the bacteria to produce the insulin for us.
We do this for a lot of other traits, especially with plants, to insert traits that we want. We'll talk more about that in a bit. So here's how we do it. The first thing we need to do is to get the DNA out of the original organism. So we would have to harvest some DNA, and that's not hard to do. You did that in class. The second thing we would need to do is to take a plasmid. A plasmid is a tiny little circular piece of DNA that bacteria have. If you recall, um, when we talked about Griffith, Griffith talked about bacteria being able to suck up traits from their environment, and Avery figured out that that was DNA. Bacteria's ability to do that is the exact trait we're going to be using, and what bacteria is sucking up during transformation is the plasmid. So both the human DNA and the bacterial DNA are cut. We say they're cut, but what we really mean is we're breaking them uh, at a particular gene sequence, and we use something called a restriction enzyme. A restriction enzyme recognizes a particular pattern of bases and makes a zigzaggy cut. Um, the zigzaggy cut separates the DNA at a particular sequence and leaves the, the, the two cut ends sticky. In other words, when we say sticky, what we're talking about is that the one side of the DNA molecule is looking for something else to attach to. So here's a good example. The red is representative of a plasmid or a little bacterial DNA. And the blue represents the DNA that we want to insert into it, so maybe the gene for human insulin. If we take a restriction enzyme and it, it cleaves it, or in other words, it cuts the DNA, this particular example is looking for the sequence AATT. We see it on both pieces, AATT, AATT, and the corresponding TTAA. It cuts it in this zigzaggy pattern, and in doing so, it leaves pieces that have AA. TT sticking out and TTAA sticking out. And so when you put the two together, some of the plasmids, some of the red and some of the blue will stick back together with red and blue, but some of them will also find a combination. So the new DNA is equally likely to bond to these pieces from the, from the bacterial DNA. And what we result with is a plasmid that has a section of gene now inserted into it. So when that happens, the bases pair up, just like we, we saw in, in replication. And the recombined DNA is inserted uh, into the bacteria cell. And so remember, bacteria suck up that DNA, and so we don't necessarily need to even do anything with a pipette or insert anything physically. We can just put the bacteria in an environment that has those plasmids. And then once the bacteria uh, has the new DNA, it has no way of knowing that that gene isn't its own gene, and so the bacteria make that protein just like it would make its own protein, and in that way, we can get lots and lots of proteins that we've inserted into the DNA. Let's take a minute and review that. Being able to insert a gene into bacteria or another kind of organism and have them make a new protein is and tremendously useful. We use it for a lot of things, including transgenic crops. We're hearing a lot about transgenic crops in the news. Sometimes they're called GMOs because a lot of people are, are concerned about what they can do and what effect they have on, on people and the environment. Right now in the United States, you're probably eating a lot of them. Um, and transgenic crops can be good or bad. Um, the concerns with transgenic crops is we don't know what effect they'll have on humans in terms of um, introducing resistance to chemicals in terms of introducing genes that could maybe lead to cancer. Um, and so there's a lot of untested scariness out there with transgenic crops. There are some benefits, though, and the reason why they exist in the first place is because they allow the crops to grow where it's drought resistant or heat resistant or to not be, um, n not be susceptible to, pesticide, uh, to insects so they don't need as much pesticides. So there's some good benefits and some bad benefits to them, uh, potentially bad benefits to them. Um, we have recombinant vaccines that are made using uh, this technology. We have um, lots of proteins that we use to take supplementally, like insulin or um, human growth factors or other proteins that humans might not be able to make on their own. And potentially, we have the ability to treat people who have genetic conditions by inserting good genes into the cells using viruses. Remember, viruses insert their own genes into cells, and so we can use virus technology to insert genes into, into cells with the hopes of making uh, 
positive changes in people. The technology for that is, is still being worked out. Um, but there's a lot, a lot, a lot of potential um, to do various things, even make bacteria that will clean up after oil spills. Let's take another second in review. So we can talk about cloning entire individuals, just like we talked about cloning a gene when we talked about recombinant DNA. So clones aren't quite the, the clone wars that we see in Star Wars. We're certainly not there yet. Clones are a means of asexual reproduction. So when we clone an organism, or by the way, when we make a clone, we're making a baby. We're not making, like, if I were to clone myself, I would be getting a little baby that looks like me and that has my gen genetics, not another Monty next to me that has the same memories and thoughts and everything else. So when we clone, what we're doing is we're taking um, the donor. So if I wanted to clone myself, I'd be the donor. And we're taking the nucleus out of the donor, and then we're taking an egg from another animal and removing the nucleus from the egg. And so we combine the first organism's nucleus, putting it into another organism's empty egg that has all the stuff that the cell needs, except the nucleus. We fuse them and then allow that um, fertilized cell to be in, implanted into a foster mother, or in other words, a surrogate, that will incubate and grow the offsprings, um, or the embryo, and when the baby is able to be born, when the embryo is fully developed, it will be born a clone of the first organism. Another really exciting area of research comes with RNAi. RNAi allows us to turn off genes because RNAi's job is to destroy genes that have a viral shape. So if you recall, viruses infect cells by inserting their DNA into the cell. The cell doesn't know the difference between the new DNA and its own DNA, so the cell makes the virus parts until the cell eventually explodes. Well, it turns out that some viruses have a particular shape. Viruses um, will insert RNA that is double-stranded. Remember, normal RNA is single-stranded, and it has a mirror image, so the double-stranded, remember, is complementary. So when RNAi sees, you know, sees, it's not really seeing, but when RNAi recognizes RNA that's double-stranded, since most of it's supposed to be single-stranded, it recognizes that and breaks them apart. In the video, it was the cop that did the karate chop to the, the recipes that look dangerous. In the cell, which is what you're seeing on the other side of the screen, is a little bit more complicated than that, but the analogy works. And this becomes very useful uh, for humans figuring stuff out about DNA. So one thing is that RNAi might allow us to turn off genes. So um, in the video, it talked about the person who wanted to make a, a more purple flower. And so he inserted the gene for purple, and it accidentally had that RNAi shape, and it chopped it up. It chopped up not only the more purple gene, but it chopped up all of the purple gene. So if we wanted to turn off a bad gene, potentially we could insert um, the gene in this viral shape, and RNAi would turn off not only the, the stuff we inserted, but the original bad gene. Um, so it's basically a potential way to turn off harmful genes and, and stop those bad proteins from being made. It can also help us understand what genes do. So if you want to know what something does, the best way to figure out is to turn it off. Uh, in class, I've used the analogy of figuring out the breakers. Um, so when I moved into my house, I didn't know what breakers in my fuse box went to what room. So we went downstairs, we turned off the breaker, and we went and saw what lights went off in, in my house and go, oh, turn off this switch, the kitchen lights go out, that switch goes to the kitchen. Well, we can do the same thing with genes. Turn off this gene and say, oh, look, there's no purple in the flower. That gene goes with purple coloring in the flower. And so by doing that, we're, we're able to start mapping what each gene does. Let's take a minute and review. Another topic we'll talk about is uh, tools that we can use to work with DNA and um, to do specific things, that, not necessarily about changing anything about an organism, but rather studying DNA. We talked about electrophoresis and DNA fingerprinting in class. There are some other things like PCR and DNA sequencing that we'll talk about here. So. Um, you might have seen on TV that sometimes a very tiny DNA sample, like a speck of blood, has been left behind in a crime scene. PCR is a way of making sure that there's enough blood to test. So PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, and it's basically a way of taking a small sample of DNA and increasing the quantity so that there can be lots of DNA. The steps of PCR are actually pretty straightforward. The first step is to heat up the DNA. 
When we heat up a molecule, it moves faster, so that DNA starts to vibrate more and more. Well, remember, hydrogen bonds are the only thing holding together the two strands, and although they're strong in numbers, they're not strong enough to withstand really, really fast motion. So those hydrogen bonds break. When the bonds break, then we cool down the temperature, and the strands are now separate, and we can take a primer, which, remember, is just something that starts replication. We can take the primer, the primer attaches on, and DNA polymerase can build a new strand by complementary base pairing, just like we saw in replication. Now we went from having one strand to those two, those two separate strands, each having a new, new side, just like in replication. When we repeat the process, we go from having one strand to two strands, and now those two strands become four strands, and, and so forth. Here's a video that shows it real nicely. Polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, uses repeated cycles of heating and cooling to make many copies of a specific region of DNA. First, the temperature is raised to near boiling, causing the double-stranded DNA to separate or denature into single strands. When the temperature is decreased, short DNA sequences known as primers bind or anneal to complementary matches on the target DNA sequence. The primers bracket the target sequence to be copied. At a slightly higher temperature, the enzyme TAC polymerase, shown here in blue, binds to the primed sequences and adds nucleotides to extend the second strand. This completes the first cycle. In subsequent cycles, the process of denaturing, annealing, and extending are repeated to make additional DNA copies. After three cycles, the target sequence defined by the primers begins to accumulate. After 30 cycles, as many as a billion copies of the target sequence are produced from a single starting molecule. Let's take a minute and review. The remaining DNA tools we're just going to kind of do a real brief overview of. The first one is DNA sequencing. And DNA sequencing is really just a way of determining the order of the nucleotide. So what is the A, A, C, G, G, T, C code uh, in a particular gene or molecule? We do that by labeling the DNA, then, then making pieces that we can cut. And the pieces of different size, we're able to pair up and see the entire length. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, but let's talk briefly about why we would do that. So we would do it to find uh, the order within a particular sequence of DNA, like within a gene. We might do that to help predict the function of the gene, to help determine what the amino acids will be. Uh, we can compare genes of, of similar sequences to different organisms, like we did with insulin and cow DNA. Uh, we can identify where there are mutations and what the effect of those mutations would be, and a great number of other things. To sequence the DNA, what we do is we take an unknown sequence, like the one on the left. We don't actually know what that sequence is, but in this picture we do. And we would have four different solutions put in. Each solution would have a base that is labeled. In other words, we would have bases that we know what they are. And so in this solution, there would be regular nucleotides and then labeled Gs. And those G nucleotides would each be modified in a way that when, the, when they're put down, another base can't attach to it. And so what that happens is every time we put this G down, we'd have, we put one here and we put one here, we'd have strands of different lengths. Same thing with the A and T and the C. But then we would put the pieces through electrophoresis. And what that would do is it would create bands of different lengths. And so we would know that the bands ended in each of these letters. So the first band is G, G, and then T, T are the next, um, the next biggest pieces, and then T, and then A, and then A, and so forth. And we can actually see the sequence of DNA. This sounds a lot more complicated. It's actually kind of straightforward. Um, and it's a great way of actually finding the sequence of a, a segment of DNA. There were a lot of things that were discovered by the Human Genome Project. The first is just how big DNA is. It's over 3 billion nucleotides long, and that there are over 23,000 genes. We still don't know what they all do. That's why where things like RNAi come in handy. It's uh, important to note that the 23,000 genes that we have only represent a small portion of our DNA. There's a lot of sections between the genes that are non-coding. 
um, the coding section, in other words, the ones that actually get turned into proteins, are pretty similar because, of course, all humans have pretty much the same recipe for saliva. Uh, but there's a lot of differences in the non-coding sections, and it's those non-coding sections that we, we use to um, do a lot of our identification of, of DNA fingerprinting with. There are some other tools of DNA that we're just going to very briefly discuss. Uh, one of them is microanalysis. Microarray analysis basically is a way of um, determining how the expression of genes uh, is affected by certain things, including environmental factors. It's used a lot in studying cancer. And essentially, um, we're going to label different types of cells. In this picture, we have normal cells and cancer cells, and they show up differently. We can then put the cells in this little micro way. We mix them together. And then the colors that show up, um, some of them are, the red ones are expressed um, in certain situations. The green ones are expressed in another. The yellow ones are expressed by their environment. So it, a lot of it controls with, okay, you have a gene, but what determines whether a gene is expressed? Um, it's a lot more complicated than that, but that's good enough for now. There are other things we can do, and they're not really even tools, but other areas of study. So uh, pharmacogenetics is a way of studying how genetics affect, is affected by, um, how medication is affected by one's in genetics. Um, gene therapy, we talked about, is a way of treating genetic disorders. Uh, we're still working out the kinks, but it's very possible that in the future, when you have a genetic disorder, you'll go and get gene therapy rather than medicine. We also do a lot of trying to catalog genetic information. So bioinformatics is basically creating a, a database of genetic information. You might have seen the commercials for Ancestry.com, and they'll analyze your DNA and tell you whether you're German or Scottish or whatever. Um, we do this for dogs. My dog is a mutt, and I actually sent her DNA away to find out what breed she has in her. Um, proteomics is cataloging the structure and function of a protein. So there's a lot of proteins that we don't, we're don't we still learning what their function are, that we use X-ray crystallography for that. And so we're trying to get a list of that and, and, and cataloging that in the human genome. And then the HAP map is basically trying to catalog the variation that exists in the world. Um, and that's going to help study different populations and, and what, what genes cause disease. And, and so there's, like I said, there's just a lot, a lot of research to be done for anyone that's interested. Let's take a minute and review one last time. As always, if you have questions, make sure you come see me. A very small portion of this video will be on the quiz. So don't be overly concerned if you're pretty sketchy on some of the details.